to this event for the York Festival of Ideas. My name is Matthew Townend. I'm a professor in the Department of English and Related Literature and the Centre for Medieval Studies at the University of York. And I'm absolutely delighted to be hosting this session on Conquered, the Last Children of Anglo-Saxon England. Before I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, there are a few uh, techno technical notes which I just need to uh, run through with you. All right. Um, firstly, um, we hope to have time for question and answers after the speaker uh, this evening. That'll be 15 or 20 minutes for questions. Uh, so you'll see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A function. If you're watching live, you can add, ask questions um, through that function throughout the talk or at the end. Um, and we'll use those for our discussion. Obviously, uh, if you have any problems, uh, technical issues such as Wi-Fi failure, um, and you lose the link, don't worry. You can just rejoin the rejoin the event uh, using the original link. And of course, today's event um, is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch again. Finally, um, uh, subtitles are available for this event, uh, so you can switch them on using the CC live transcript function at the bottom of the screen. Brilliant. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Eleanor Parker is lecturer in medieval English literature at Brasenose College at the University of Oxford. She's very well known as a scholar of Old English, Old Norse and the uh, post-Norman conquest period. Uh, she's published a book uh, called, a wonderful book called Dragon Lords about the afterlife of Viking traditions, uh, Viking stories in post-conquest England. And she's talking us today uh, about the subject of her latest book uh, about uh, the children, the last children of Anglo-Saxon England. She's well known to many people uh, as a blogger, as a clerk under the title, a clerk of Oxford, and also as a columnist uh, for history today. So for her talk tonight, the Norman Conquest, of course, is one of the most momentous events in uh, English history with enormous consequences. But how did it impact on those who were children at the time uh, and those who lived through it into adulthood in the Norman Conquest? So we're really delighted to welcome Eleanor to the Festival of Ideas as she shares with us a really interesting, fresh take on the Norman Conquest, exploring the lives of those children who found themselves uprooted and affected by the dramatic events of 1066. So Eleanor, a warm welcome to you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Matt, for that, that lovely introduction. Um, and I'm very pleased to be here. So I'm looking forward to, to uh, getting some lovely questions and um, I hope you all enjoy it. Right, I'm just gonna start by sharing my screen, make sure that works okay. Okay, here we go. So it's lovely to be with you virtually. Um, I don't know how many of you are, are kind of physically in York right now. Um, I know some of you are. Um, I personally am in Oxfordshire, so unfortunately I couldn't make it to York, but I am gonna be asking you to come with me in spirit um, to York in the summer of 1069. Um, because in that year, York became the epicenter of rebellion against the new Norman rulers of England, almost three years after the Battle of Hastings had brought England suddenly and violently under Norman control. The events of 1066 changed England dramatically, but of course those changes did not happen overnight. They developed over the subsequent years and decades, um, and what I'm interested in, as Matt was saying, is how those changes were experienced by the generation of young people who were growing up through that period. A generation of English children reaching adulthood in a country which was changing very fast um, as they were learning how to adapt or not managing to adapt to this very new Norman world. So in my book, I explore the stories of a number of different young men and women of this generation in different kinds of positions. Um, and I would love to talk about all of them today, but of course I don't have time for that um, in 40 minutes. So I'm gonna focus on just a few of them. Um, and kind of in honor of York, I thought I would look especially at those who took part in the anti-Norman rebellion at York in 1069, um, and then think about what happened to them afterwards. So before I talk about that, let me introduce the main characters in our story today. 
So all of the, the young men and women you can see there, these are our children of Anglo-Saxon England. They were all roughly the same age. They were in their teens in the 1060s. And they all belonged to families which had been prominent in England before the Norman conquest and had suddenly lost that power and status, leaving these young survivors in a very precarious position um, when the political situation changed. And these young people had other things in common too. All were fatherless. They had all lost their fathers, either in 1066 or some years earlier, um, although their mothers were still around. As children, they had all been educated for lives of opportunity and power. Um, but after 1066, they were reaching adulthood in a country dominated by a new ruling class who were imposing their authority on all aspects of English life and were often either indifferent or actively hostile to the country, culture of the country they had conquered or were eager to appropriate aspects of that culture for their own purposes. So these young people had all suffered significant loss as a result of the conquest. Um, and in the years that followed, they had to decide how to respond to the personal and political changes that it had brought for them. So I'll give you a little background on who these people were and then their lives before the conquest. So first of all, we have Edgar Atheling and his sisters, Margaret and Christina. By the end of 1066, these three teenagers were the sole remaining representatives of the Anglo-Saxon royal line. So as I imagine you all know, if you know anything about the Norman Conquest, Edward the Confessor, King of England at the beginning of 1066, had no children of his own, um, hence really the entire problem. Um, but Edgar and his sisters, they were the grandchildren of Edward's half-brother, Edmund Ironside, who had briefly been King of England in 1016. And Edmund died in that year, um, leaving two infant sons, very young children, um, and his kingdom was then conquered by the Danish King Canute, who went on to rule England for almost 20 years. During all of that time, Edward the Confessor um, was forced to live in Normandy, um, away from England, before returning to the country in the 1040s. And the sons of Edmund Ironside were also forced to flee England for their safety. They ended up in Hungary, where one of them, also called Edward, married a woman named Agatha and had these three children, Edgar, Margaret and Christina. So those, these children were born in Hungary, probably knowing very little about England and probably with not much expectation of ever going there or finding out much about it. Um, but in the 1050s, when Edward the Confessor, by now King of England and childless, was thinking about the succession, he sent messengers to the continent to kind of track down his nephew and bring him and his family back to England. So Edward the Exile, as he's often called, and Agatha and their three children um, came to England in 1057. And Edward died very suddenly soon afterwards um, and leaving his wife and children in this strange new country. Edward the Confessor in a way then kind of adopted them or had them educated and treated the boy Edgar as a potential heir um, since after Edward, Edgar really was the only surviving male heir of the line of the Kings of England. And that's why he's known as Edgar Atheling um, in, from contemporary sources. That's an Anglo-Saxon term referring to someone of royal blood, someone eligible to inherit the throne. Um, Edward the Confessor's plans for the succession after his death have been the subject of a huge amount of debate. Um, but it seems quite likely that at least at some points um, in his reign, he and also other people at the English court considered that Edgar had the strongest natural right to be king. But of course, that's not always enough. <laughs> So in January 1066, when Edward the Confessor died, Edgar was still fairly young, um, 14 or so, and apparently not considered old enough to become king, or at least not old enough to defend his claim against anyone who was going to press theirs more forcefully. So instead, the crown was promptly seized by Edward's brother-in-law, Harold Godwinson. And that brings us to the next group of characters in our story, who are Harold's children. So there is Harold Godwinson being crowned in January 1066, of course, on the Bayer Tapestry. Um, and Harold was able to take the crown because he was not only the king's brother-in-law, but also a member of the most powerful non-royal family in mid 11th century England. His father Godwin had risen to prominence under King Knut as Earl of Wessex. Um, so benefiting very much from the Danish conquest of England just as Edward the Exile and his family had been materially harmed by it. 
and Godwin married a relative of Canute, a Danish woman named Geetha. So the Godwinsons, Harold and his brothers, they were English on their father's side, but on their mother's side, they were very close relatives of the kings of Denmark. And that's going to be important to our story later on. Godwin and Geetha had a large family of children, six sons and three daughters, who by the end of Edward the Confessor's reign held many of the most powerful positions in English politics, including some of the largest and wealthiest earldoms in the kingdom. When Edward died, Harold was in a strong position to take the throne, whatever Ed Edgar Atheling and his supporters might have thought about it. But Harold was not just a king, he was also a father. When he died in battle at Hastings, alongside two of his brothers, he left behind several surviving children. The exact number is a bit unclear because they were all relatively young at the time of Harold's death, um, so not really yet old enough to have done very much um, or, or kind of made their way into the historical record. Um, but he seems to have had at least seven children by different women, uh, probably most of them with his long-term consort, Edith. Um, and I'll talk about five of them, um, the ones we kind of know the most about really. So three sons, Godwin, Edmund and Magnus, and then two daughters, Geetha and Gunild, all of them probably in their teens or younger when their father died. And they were in an especially difficult position when they lost their father because the new Norman rulers of England, having defeated Harold in battle, were now very keen to present him as an illegitimate king, a usurper and a perjurer, and to blacken his name as much as possible. So his children, who had been born into this incredibly wealthy and powerful dynasty, were now the heirs to a much more difficult inheritance. One of the reasons that we don't know for sure how many children Harold had, or have very much evidence about their lives at all, is that after 1066, it became controversial to write about Harold. Um, so not many medieval English historians were kind of willing to explore what had happened to the survivors of this family. By contrast, we know quite a lot about the last character in our story today, and that's Waltheof, a young man who was also the survivor of a family which had been powerful before the conquest. So Waltheof's father, Seward, had been Earl of Northumbria, the huge and important earldom which spanned the north of England. And like Harold Godwinson's family, Waltheof was part Danish because Seward, like Harold's mother, Geetha, um, was Danish and had come to England during the reign of Canute when England was part of Canute's Scandinavian empire. As Earl of Northumbria, Seward had married into an Anglo-Saxon family, the ancient line of the Earls of Bamber, who had ruled northern Northumbria for many generations. So Waltheof was Danish on his father's side, but on his mother's side, he had very deep roots in Northumbria. And it's likely that Waltheof, he was born around 1050, um, and he probably spent his childhood kind of in or around York, that seems most likely, um, because Seward seems to have had his residence there. Um, when he died, he chose to be buried in York in the Church of St Olaf, um, which he had founded there himself, and which is still there, and <laughs> designed as the place of his own burial. And Seward dedicated this church to the Norwegian saint, um, King Olaf, who had only died a few decades earlier in Norway. And that suggests that Seward and his family, like the Godwinsons, kept in very close touch with what was going on um, politically and culturally in Scandinavia. They really did have very strong continuing links to the Scandinavian world. So Seward died about 10 years before the conquest. Um, and at that point, the earldom passed to Harold Godwinson's brother, Tosti. Um, but by the time of the conquest, Waltheof was old enough to hold a smaller southern earldom um, based around Northampton and Huntingdon in the East Midlands. In 1066, Waltheof doesn't seem to have fought at Hastings, at least we don't have any evidence that he did, um, but he may have fought in some of the earlier battles of that autumn in which the English tried to fend off an attempted Norwegian invasion led by Harold Hardrada. Um, there is some suggestion that Waltheof may have been at the Battle of Fulford, which was fought just outside York. Um, and given Waltheof's connection with York, it seems kind of possible that he was there. So in 1066, in the weeks after Harold's defeat at Hastings, some of the defeated English rallied for a time behind Edgar Atheling as their next king. Despite Edgar's youth, some of the English leaders acknowledged him as king um, and promised that they would fight to defend his rights, um, but that kind of never came to pass. Those efforts to, to organize resistance at that point uh, came to nothing. 
And so by December 1066, Edgar and other English leaders had submitted and William was crowned as king at Christmas 1066. The following year, William returned to Normandy to deal with his affairs there. And he took with him a group of leading Englishmen, um, including Edgar Atheling and Waltheof. So the idea was probably to prevent them from causing trouble in his absence. Um, they sort of, they weren't technically being held hostage, but it, that was kind of effectively the situation. And probably he just wanted them under his eye. Um, it suggests that he did see these young men, these survivors of English families, as potential sources of opposition. And meanwhile, as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle famously says, the Normans built castles widely throughout the country and oppressed the wretched people. And afterwards, it always grew very much worse. May the end be good when God wills. In terms of the peace of the kingdom, it did get much worse. While William was absent in Normandy, rebellion started brewing in England, in different parts of the country, but especially in the southwest, where it was led by the surviving members of Harold Godwinson's family. Um, William should have taken them to Normandy and kept them under his eye, failed to do that. Um, with Harold and his brothers dead, the head of the family was now their widowed mother, Geetha, whom I mentioned earlier. And Geetha seems to have been an extraordinary woman. Um, at this time, she was probably in her late 60s. She was a widow. She had lost four of her sons within the space of just a few weeks in 1066. And now she was left to pick up the pieces of this shattered family. And she seems to have taken quite an active role in encouraging resistance to the Normans. Even though she was, you know, the mother of the discredited King Harold, considering her age and her position, she probably would have just been left alone by the Normans um, and lived, you know, allowed to live in peace if she had been willing to submit quietly, as her daughter Edith did, um, the widow of Edward the Confessor. But apparently Geetha was not going to give in without a fight. She and her supporters seem to have coordinated armed resistance around Exeter, a city to which Geetha had close links. In the spring of 1068, they managed to hold Exeter against the Normans. The city was besieged for 18 days. William the Conqueror himself came to try and break the siege, which again suggests he regarded it pretty seriously. Um, and he took very harsh measures to subdue the rebels, forcing Exeter into submission, ravaging the surrounding countryside and allowing his men to raid wherever they wanted. At the same time, Harold's sons went to Ireland to seek support there from former allies of their fathers. And towards the end of 1068, while William was kind of distracted by unrest in Northumbria, some of Harold's sons came from Ireland with an army and sailed into the Bristol Channel. They attacked Bristol, they fought against the people of the town, um, and then sailed down the coast of Somerset, kind of probably hoping to recruit support in places where their family had formerly um, had held lands but they were met in battle and many were killed on both sides. So they had to flee back to Ireland with their plunder. Meanwhile, Edgar Atheling, after his return from Normandy, also decided it was time to make a move. With his mother and sisters, he left England in the summer of 1068 and went to Scotland where they took refuge with the Scottish King Malcolm, who was keeping a careful watch on events south of the border. What happened in Northumbria especially was always of concern to the Scottish kings um, and Malcolm seems to have decided at this point to support Edgar and the English rebels in their fight against the Normans. But that support came at a price. Malcolm expressed a wish to marry Edgar's sister Margaret. He might have had this idea in mind for some time, um, even before the conquest, and it's possible that um, it had actually been kind of an agreement between him and Edward the Confessor um, that, you know, Edward might have seen a marriage to the Scottish king as a, an appropriate alliance for his, his great niece. Even though these English royals were now displaced, driven out of England, Malcolm must still have felt that an alliance with the line of the Anglo-Saxon kings would have had a kind of a value for him. And he wasn't the only one to see the benefits of allying himself through marriage to the survivors of English families displaced by the conquest, as we'll see later on. This contemporary source, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, records the marriage of Malcolm and Margaret, but makes it poignantly clear just how little choice the girl had in the matter. So it says, then King Malcolm began to desire Edgar's sister Margaret for his wife, but he and his men all argued against it for a long time, and she herself also refused and said that she would not have him or anyone if the divine mercy would grant 
that she should please the mighty Lord in virginity with a bodily heart in pure continence in this brief life. So in other words, she wanted to remain unmarried um, for religious reasons, perhaps to become a nun, something like that. But the king urged her brother pressingly until he said yes. And indeed, he dared not do otherwise because they had come into the king's power. Then the king married her, although it was against her will. The language here is very blunt about how the writer of this, this entry sees the dynamics of the situation. Um, Margaret, like other young women of her generation, was in a difficult position. These female survivors of Anglo-Saxon noble families had now become the representatives of lines of inheritance, which had a kind of value, a tangible or intangible value for the Norman conquerors, but also for foreign kings like Malcolm. And this kind of made them targets. Margaret, essentially a refugee at Malcolm's court, was especially vulnerable. But I'll come back to this marriage and its consequences later on. From Edgar's point of view, yeah, from, Ed, sorry, from Edgar's point of view, Malcolm was a very useful ally because he was prepared to lend his support to English rebellion against the Normans. So the following year, 1069, Edgar twice travelled from Scotland into northern England in an attempt to kind of combine forces with potential allies against the Normans. And both times this resistance centred on the city of York. I promised we would get there eventually and now here we are. Um, and York was really badly affected by the conflict of those months. So this is what, again, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says about the events of that summer. Edgar Atheling came with all the Northumbrians to York and the people of the city made peace with him. And King William came upon them from the south unawares with a surging army and put them to flight and killed those who could not flee. That was many hundreds of men. He ravaged the city and treated St. Peter's Minster disgracefully and also ravaged and humiliated all the others. And the Atheling went back to Scotland. So Edgar was forced to retreat and William was clearly determined to clamp down very hard on this on the rebellious city. But his attraction, his, his attention was distracted because immediately after Edgar had fled back to Scotland, the sons of Harold Godwinson appeared again on the coast of Devon with a fleet of 64 ships. Um, once again, they, they, they tried to, <laughs> to kind of fight their way um, back into England, but they were um, swiftly fought off by a Norman army, fiercely repelled um, and had to return to Ireland. Um, so it wasn't successful, but William's attention must have been really split um, in two directions at this point. And it is possible that the rebels were kind of coordinating with each other um, to, to split resources. In September, Edgar tried again, joining forces this time with some really important allies. So Waltheof, but also an army sent by the Danish king, Svein Estrison, so Harold Godwinson's cousin. In September, three sons of King Svein came with 240 ships from Denmark into the Humber. And there came to meet them Prince Edgar and Earl Waltheof and Marleswain and Earl Gospatrick with the Northumbrians and all the people of the land riding and marching with a huge army, greatly rejoicing. And so they all resolutely went to York and broke down and destroyed the castle and seized countless treasures there and killed many hundreds of Frenchmen and took many away to their ships. Before the fleet arrived, the French had burned down the city and completely ravaged and burned the holy minster of St. Peter. When the king learned this, he went northwards with all of his army, which he could gather and wholly ravaged and laid waste the surrounding area. So it was a very violent and turbulent few months, but you can really see, I think, that the sympathy of the writer, at least of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle here, so an English writer, English-speaking writer, um, is very much on the side of Edgar and his allies. Um, and there's a real horror at the kind of ferocity of William's response, especially the treatment of York and, um, and um, York Minster. And the castle at York, which is mentioned here, had really only just been built by the Normans um, the year before as a, an imposing visual symbol of the new regime's power. So for the rebels to destroy that had a kind of symbolic power as well as a military value. And we do have a few accounts of this battle at York um, and they particularly emphasize the role of Waltheof and his heroism and his courage um, in this fight. 
Um, and at this point, it's kind of worth remembering, I think, that while Theoph, of course, would have known York much better than most of the other people in this army, much better than Edgar Atheling, for sure, or the Danes, um, he would have been familiar with the landscape and the political terrain. Um, and it must have been kind of a powerful thing for him to be fighting in the city where his father had ruled, where his father was buried. And his actions seem to have made quite an impression. So the 12th century historian William of Malmesbury says, in the battle at York, um, Wathiof laid low many of the Normans single-handed, beheading them one by one as they issued from the gate. He had great strength of arm, powerful chest muscles, his whole frame tough and tall. I looked very hard to find a, 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 an illustration that might kind of depict this moment for you, but sadly I couldn't find anything. So if there are any artists who want to depict Wathiof for depict, decapitating Normans, I think that would be a good subject. There's also a surviving poem which praises Wathiof's heroism. Um, written probably by someone who knew him personally. Um, so it's a poem in Old Norse, probably by, most likely by a Norwegian or an Icelandic poet, um, who seems to have been one of Waltheof's followers, because he speaks elsewhere of Waltheof as my lord. Um, and it's a fairly bloodthirsty but quite impressive celebration of Waltheof's victory over a group of Normans. So he says, a hundred of the king's soldiers were made to burn in hot flames by the Igir of battle, um, which is a, a kind of name for wealthy, I'll come back to it. Um, that was a roasting evening for men. It's known that warriors lay under the claw of the ogress's steed. The grey horse of the troll woman was given food from the corpses of the Normans. So we don't know for sure what's, what incident might be being referenced here, but it does seem likely to relate to something that happened during the Battle of York, um, especially given the references to fire, which are mentioned in other accounts of the battle. And this poet takes a very grim pleasure in the deaths of the Normans. He's kind of relishing this gruesome image of, of the battle as a roasting evening. So like a night for feasting on roasted meat, um, which is the flesh of the Normans and, and their flesh has been left for the wolves to devour. Um, not literally, we, we can hope it's a, it's a kind of poetic trope. But this verse is, is very interesting um, because it belongs to a tradition of Old Norse poetry, which is often used to celebrate warriors and Viking kings. Um, it's very often military, often very violent, um, but also poetically very sophisticated. And it's very much not an English poetic tradition. It was a tradition imported into England, brought into England by the Vikings. Um, and it's, it's very rare to have a poem of this kind written about an English warrior. Uh, like Waltheof. So notice that it uses details of Norse mythology, for instance. So Ygir um, is a name for Odin, the god Odin, as in Yggdrasil, um, if you know anything about Norse mythology. Um, so Waltheof is being called the Odin of battle as a sort of name meaning warrior. Um, and there are these references to trolls as well as ogresses and wolves and so on. So all very kind of <laughs> Norse. Um, so that, you know, you've got these references, even though Waltheof himself was a Christian, his father founded a church, as I said, and, and as I'll talk about later, Waltheof became a Christian saint. Um, but all of those mythological allusions, they're part of the kind of texture and the conventions of this genre of poetry. Um, and clearly Waltheof and the people around him understood and appreciated this kind of verse, which tells us something interesting about how strongly Scandinavian Waltheof and his circle must have been. At York, they were fighting alongside the Danish army, um, who may have been hoping not to put Edgar Atheling on the English throne, but to conquer England for themselves. Um, and it's not entirely clear whose side Waltheof would have been on, whose interests he would have supported. Anyway, despite their victory, this triumph of Waltheof and Edgar was very short-lived. William recaptured the city and punished the surrounding region for its support for the rebels with the notorious harrying of the north. After this, Edgar and Waltheof and the sons of Harold all seem to have given up on the idea of organised resistance to the Normans, at least at this stage. Some of the rebels didn't. They, they regathered, they tried again at Ely the following year. Um, that's where Hera with the Wake got involved, um, the most famous anti-Norman rebel, maybe. I don't have time to talk about him, unfortunately, but I do talk about him a lot in my books, so if you're interested. Um, but of course, that this rebellion too was, was ultimately unsuccessful. So what happened to these young people after the collapse of their rebellions? What did they do for the rest of their lives? They had quite varied fates. 
um, and the diverse ways in which their lives turned out and the ways in which their stories were remembered or forgotten are very revealing about how England was changing in the years after 1066. So to take Wealthy off first, after the rebellion was defeated at York, he agreed to submit to the king um, and he was pardoned. And William was very generous to him. Um, he arranged for Waltheof to marry the king's own niece, Judith. And then in 1072, Waltheof was given his father's former earldom of Northumbria. So William had perhaps decided that Waltheof could be a useful ally in trying to control the north of England, which was always a rather uh, tumultuous place. Um, and it was best to keep his former enemies close. Maybe that was the idea. Waltheof's long-standing connections in Northumbria on his father's and his mother's side uh, probably made him kind of potentially useful in William's eyes. But this peaceful arrangement didn't last. Three years later, just three years later, Waltheof became involved in another rebellion, this time led not by English rebels, but by the earls of Hereford and East Anglia. It's not exactly clear what Waltheof's involvement in this rebellion was, what exactly the rebels were trying to do, but it does seem to have been another attempt to defy William the Conqueror's authority. Waltheof, although apparently aware of the plot and helping to keep it secret, was not actually its leader. Um, his his co-conspirators seem to have been kind of the more active movers. The revolt was swiftly suppressed, the rebels were harshly punished, um, and with effect, because this proved to be the last serious rebellion against Norman rule in England. And Waltheof, although apparently the least guilty of the three earls, received the harshest punishment. So the other two earls, they lost their English lands, one was imprisoned, um, and the other just left England for, for Brittany, where he had other possessions, so he was fine. Um, but only Waltheof, Waltheof alone, was sentenced to death. He was beheaded in Winchester on the 31st of May, 1076. And it's not really clear why he received a much harsher sentence than his fellow conspirators. Um, it may just be that William was kind of glad of an opportunity to get rid of him, really. Um, you know, it was a chance to dispose of someone who would maybe seem like he wasn't going to be very loyal. Um, but his death was controversial. It was seen at the time by many as too harsh, um, as disproportionate. And at the place where Waltheof was buried, um, Crowland Abbey in Lincolnshire, which you can see on the screen there, um, Waltheof came to be seen as a martyr and as a saint. So some people thought he'd got what he deserved, but in the region around Crowland, certainly, he was remembered as a victim of Norman injustice, as someone who was cruelly punished just because the Normans were kind of especially hostile to the English. And Waltheof's death is also lamented in the Old Norse poem that I quoted earlier which might give us an insight into how Waltheof's followers interpreted what had happened to him. And this says, certainly valiant Waltheof has been betrayed under a truce by William, he who bloodied weapons, who cut the icy sea from the south. Such a great description of the Norman conquest. Um, it's true, slaughter in England will be a long time ceasing. Yet my lord was brave and a more splendid, generous leader will never die. So slaughter in England will be a long time ceasing. That's the judgment of this poet on, on the Norman conquest, really. The list, this lament for the fate of Waltheof and the fate of England um, is only recorded in Norse sources, um, which suggests that maybe some of Waltheof's former supporters had, had carried this poem to Scandinavia after his death. It probably seemed that with Waltheof's death, the last hope of rebellions or uh, no hope of rebellion or kind of last hope of, of um, pushing back against the Norman conquest was really gone after 1076 um, and it was time to seek new opportunities. In the years after the conquest, many English exiles seem to have made their way to Scandinavia, um, including the children of Harold Gobinson. I have to use pictures of Harold Gobinson because there are pictures of his children, so I <laughs> just get more pictures of Harold, unfortunately. After the failure of their rebellion in the Southwest, Harold's mother, Geetha, fled with a party of other English women and her granddaughter, who was also called Geetha. And they went first to Flanders, but then on to Denmark, where the sons of Harold joined them at the court of their relative King Svein Estrison. And we don't know what happened to Harold's sons after that. They are just lost to history. But we do know what happened to the younger Geetha, Harold's daughter, because she made an important marriage 
As a relative of Spain, the king, and the daughter of the English king, um, she was a useful diplomatic asset. Um, and so Spain arranged a marriage for her with Vladimir II, the future Grand Prince of Kiev. The marriage took place around 1075, the same year while Theof was imprisoned back in England. And then the following year, Githa gave birth to a son in Novgorod. Her son was known as Harold, at least as one of his names, which suggests that there was a, you know, a kind of deliberate intention of perpetuating the memory of his grandfather, of remembering Harold's legacy. Quite a contrast to how he was treated in England. So we don't, Githa then lived on for another 30 years, having more children, dying around 1107. It might be that her brothers decided to go with her um, and, and kind of new, to, to Novgorod and made new life for themselves there, but we don't really know what happened to them. But through her, her children, Githa had many descendants and many of them married back, um, first of all, into the, the royal families of Norway and Denmark over the course of the 12th century, and then subsequently throughout the, <laughs> the royal families across Europe. So in fact, Harold through Githa is the ancestor of, um, of many uh, European royal families, including English monarchs from Edward III onwards. But none of this, none of the fate of Githa and her brothers significantly is recorded in English sources. We only know of it from elsewhere. So in the histories of Scandinavian kings, for instance, Githa's marriage and her descent from Harold Godwinson and other details about the Godwinson family long continue to be a source of interest. But under Norman rule, England was growing further and further away from the Scandinavian world of which it had once been an integral part, the world in which those royal connections had value and meaning. In the Norman sphere to which England now belonged, in which Norman narratives dominated the recording of English history, there was just no place for the children of the disgraced Harold Godwinson. So Githa and her brothers were lost to English view. Only one of Harold's children remained in England when her grandmother and sister went off to Denmark. And this was Gunild, uh, who was left in the care of her aunt, Queen Edith, at Wilton Abbey in Wiltshire. Wilton and other nunneries were known as places where English women took refuge after the conquest, um, partly because of the violence of the times, but specifically, as contemporary sources say, out of fear of the danger that Norman men posed to English women. Gunild grew up at Wilton in her aunt's care, and when she reached adulthood, she did attract interest from men who were remembering her ancestry and saw some kind of interest in her lineage, um, but especially perhaps some of the wealth that she might have inherited from her mother. Sometime before 1093, Gunild left Wilton in rather complicated circumstances um, and went to live with the Breton nobleman, Alan Rufus, um, who was Lord of Richmond in Yorkshire and one of the richest men in England. She doesn't seem to have married him. Um, and when he died around 1093, Gunild then became the partner of his brother, also called Alan. And this relationship was controversial. It attracted some kind of disquiet um, from contemporaries because in the eyes of some people, she was a sort of runaway renegade nun. Um, so Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury, wrote letters to her telling her, you know, it was shameful for her to, to desert her nunnery, she should leave Alan, she should go back to the nunnery. Um, although as far as we know, she didn't pay any attention to him. Um, but the nature or the origins of this, this controversial relationship are also quite unclear, because um, it's possible that Gunnar just willingly chose to elope with Alan, which is what Anselm thought happened. But it is also possible that perhaps he abducted her or he forced her to go away with him. He possessed lands that had formerly belonged to Gunild's wealthy mother, um, and that might have been why he was kind of interested in her. Gunild's story, you know, the, stalker, the story of, of King Harold's daughter is kind of sometimes presented in rather romantic terms, as if she sort of ran away with Alan to, to escape the boredom of being a nun. Um, and in some ways, the change might have brought her advantages given Alan's wealth and status. But Gunnild was also in a, a friendless and rather vulnerable position at this point in her life. Um, she'd spent all her childhood, all her early life at Wilton. Um, after her aunt died, her, she had no family left in England. She was kind of the only survivor of the Godwinsons at that point. And so her options were very much limited by circumstance. So like Margaret, as I mentioned earlier, if she was sought out for the sake of her lineage, she might have felt she had little choice in the matter.
What about Edgar Atheling and his sisters? So Edgar actually lived on for a very long time after 1069. He had a varied and eventful career. He moved frequently. He traveled widely across Europe. Um, and in lots of ways, Edgar adapted himself to the new configuration of the Norman world. After giving up on the hope of resistance to the Normans, he spent time in Scotland and in Flanders. Um, and then in 1074, he formally submitted to William and spent some years at the English court. So he was sort of allowed to be present at court, but he was never given an earldom or, or much wealth. So by contrast to William's treatment of wealthy of, he was kept much more at arm's length and not put into a position of influence. He stayed in England for a decade or so, and then apparently realizing he was never going to prosper in England, he left the court in 1086. He began to travel more widely and he went to other parts of Europe under Norman rule. Um, so that so was Normandy itself, but also Apulia. Um, he apparently became close friends with Robert Curtos, William the Conqueror's eldest son, um, who was by now Duke of Normandy. So Edgar spent time with him. He was also often in Scotland. Um, Malcolm and Margaret died in 1093, and after their deaths, Edgar helped to establish one of their children um, as king in Scotland, kind of defending his claim against the sons of Malcolm's first marriage. And then after that, Edgar went traveling again. This time he went to the Holy Land um, in the wake of the First Crusade. We're not sure exactly what he did there, but the stories say that he joined a group from England, that he distinguished himself in battle at Antioch, helping to conquer the city. Then he went back to Normandy, fighting alongside Robert Curtos, and then eventually he sort of retired to England, where he lived at least until the 1120s. He's not known ever to have married or had children, and we don't know the date of his death, but he does seem to have lived um, into his 70s. He was never really allowed to have any position of wealth or power himself. He had various powerful allies and friends as he traveled around, but he was often kind of moved on from place to place as the political situation changed between England and Scotland and Normandy. It was a kind of a restless life, really, but in some ways, Edgar did adapt quite well to the new possibilities and expectations which were opened up by the international connections of the Norman world. His life, although perhaps a strange one for the last prince of the Anglo-Saxon royal line, was certainly not a life without incident or achievement within what circumstances permitted for him. However, it was his sister Margaret through whom the Anglo-Saxon royal line would continue, and so I'll end with her. So I quoted earlier the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle's account of her marriage, which suggests that it was unwanted, but also emphasizes Margaret's piety, her desire to devote her life to God. And part of the reason that the Chronicler emphasizes that is that Margaret by this time was beginning to be venerated as a saint already, um, although you know, kind of written in her own time. Um, and so her life was being interpreted in that light. The intention is to stress that the marriage turned out for good, despite its difficult beginning, because that was God's will, Margaret had a destiny to do important work in Scotland. So the chronicler says here, it came to pass as God had previously ordained and it could not be otherwise, just as he says that even one sparrow may not fall into a spare snare without his providence. The foreknowing creator knew beforehand what he wanted to accomplish through her, that she would increase the glory of God in that land and guide the king from the path of error and bring him and his people together to the better way and lay aside the sinful customs which that nation previously followed, just as she afterwards did. The king married her, though it was against her will, but her ways pleased him, and he thanked God, who in his might had given him such a wife. He reflected thoughtfully, as he was a very wise man, and turned himself to God, and scorned every sin. This aforesaid queen afterwards performed many useful deeds in that country to the glory of God, and also prospered well in kingly ways, as was in her nature. She was sprung from a faithful and noble kindred, and then it gives her ancestors among the Anglo-Saxon kings, and her mother's side too. And that closing reference to her ancestry shows how, as Margaret was beginning to be thought of as a saint, the virtues for which she was celebrated were not just her own, but in some sense the spiritual power of her royal ancestors. A displaced dynasty which now had no political future, but which still retained a kind of cultural power which could be found valuable and useful. Margaret herself clearly valued her English ancestry um, to judge, for instance, from the names that she gave to her children. Um, so she and Malcolm had eight children. They were mostly named after Anglo-Saxon uh, royalty. So like Edmund and Edgar and Athelred and so on. Um, and their elder daughter was named Edith, another Anglo-Saxon name. 
and it was through Edith that the royal line they represented would return to England and through whom Margaret's story would be preserved and reshaped. In 1100, Edith married Henry I of England, uniting the new Norman dynasty with the Anglo-Saxon royal line. After her marriage, Edith commissioned an account of her mother's life, which describes her saintly influence over Malcolm, her devotion to God and her loving care for her children and her country. In this text, we see Margaret's life story being rewritten for a Norman audience, turned into a narrative of continuity and cultural harmony, which is presented as offering a kind of smooth transition from the Anglo-Saxon past. It does this by omitting some important details. So it doesn't, for instance, say anything about the loss and displacement that Margaret and her family suffered as a result of the Norman conquest. It doesn't mention Edgar Atheling um, or English rebellion or say anything about Margaret's experiences of, of conquest and exile. It's entirely focused on continuity, on suggesting that there was a version of the English past which didn't need to be rejected, but could still be useful to the Norman rulers of England. And so to close, in this way, we see a notable difference between the way Margaret's story was treated and remembered and those of her brothers and her male contemporaries. So Waltheof was swiftly dispatched, condemned by Norman writers as a traitor, even though others persisted in seeing him as a martyr. Edgar Atheling, never allowed to achieve political power, did adapt himself to the Norman world, but he's treated very scornfully by 12th century historians when they ever deign to mention him at all. Um, and he's, he's rarely mentioned in narratives of the conquest, which very much become all about William and Harold and Edward the Confessor, um, with Edgar sort of in, pushed into a marginal role, just as he is pointedly not depicted on the Bayer tapestry. The children of Harold Godwinson, whose fates lay outside England, were largely forgotten by English history. And the way all these young men are discussed or ignored by Anglo-Norman writers in the 12th century, I think suggests some kind of discomfort in writing about their lives, maybe an unwillingness to acknowledge how much this generation had lost as a result of the conquest. But the story of a woman like Margaret, through her changing roles as daughter, wife and mother, could be interpreted more positively as providing a form of continuity between past and present and future. So the celebration of her life became a way of thinking about transition and transformation, about how some aspects of Anglo-Saxon culture might be absorbed and preserved in Norman ruled England. So in that sense, Margaret and her contemporaries were, as I've called them, the last children of Anglo-Saxon England, but they were also the parents of the new country that England was to become. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Eleanor, very much indeed for a really, really wonderful uh, talk. Um, you've made sense for us of such difficult, complicated material. You've been talking to us about sources, I think, in four different languages, in Old English, in Old Norse, in Latin, and I think in medieval French or Anglo-Norman as well. And you've been presenting it to us with such a wonderful sort of clarity and concision and insight and really making sense for us of a really complicated but fascinating period. So we're greatly in your debt for that. Thank you. Uh, there are some really great questions already coming into the question and answer uh, 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 function, uh, which I will um, mediate to you and, and, and pick up some questions for you if that's all right. Um, we won't have time to get through all of them, so apologies to anybody who's asked a question that we won't be able to, to get on to. Um, but let's start with this question. You talked about um, Edgar Atheling's travels and you talked about the international con connections of the Norman world. Uh, I wonder if you could, uh, one, one listener says, I wonder if you could tell us something about the languages that he may have used or may have encountered during his travels, please. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Thinking about the languages that you, know, you had to kind of learn in order to, to pass through these different places. I mean, I'm always very interested in sort of at what point Edgar learned English or like how important English was like did he think of English as his his mother tongue or anything like that because of course he wasn't born in England his father was you know had married a, a non-English woman so um English didn't, wasn't his first language necessarily um and then as he grew up he must have had to communicate with I mean most often I guess French would be the useful language for kind of communicating across the the Norman world um but he must have kind of encountered all kinds of different cultures. I mean, you know, he, he, he met so many different cultures and spent so much time in these different places. It's just such a, an interesting variety. Um, 
and he kind of never belonged in any of those worlds exactly but he was always sort of passing through them so he must have been quite adaptable i think must you know ready to to communicate in different ways not just in terms of language but also maybe culturally and and, and you know understanding how these different places worked that's brilliant thank you very much and you'll be pleased to know from at, at, at least one comment in the question of that question and answer at least one person while listening has gone and ordered a copy of your book because they oh they want to they want to read it all um, i wonder if i could follow up on that previous question there's a question that somebody else has asked uh, which is at what point in english history then would you say that saxons and normans were no longer considered as different peoples or nations but, but becoming one that's a very interesting question. It kind of, it probably depends a bit who you would ask, I think, because so um, after the conquest, in one sense, the Normans quite quickly began to think of themselves as English, or at least as that as being a, a part of their identity. They started calling themselves, you know, the Angli and so the Anglais. Um, and so from their point of view, within, you know, almost a few years of the conquest, but certainly within a few decades, it wasn't an important distinction and yet from in the 12th century there are definitely sources kind of looking for more from the English perspective which continue to see it as a, a really important distinction that that there was a, a kind of an ongoing cultural split and important linguistics divide um, in which for instance if you were an English person who didn't want to or wasn't able to learn French and, and kind of communicate with the Normans you were going to be held back in life you know you couldn't get on in the world if you weren't going <laughs> to learn to speak French and, and sort of adopt a Norman persona I suppose Norman attitude so um, you know in one sense that divide didn't last very long but in other ways it kind of went on and on and I think if you were on kind of the wrong side of it it probably felt a lot more um, you know much more serious um, divide than if you were sort of on the winning side I guess um, yeah that, that's great here's a really wonderful question so um, uh, somebody asked whether um, if there's any one of these children that you've been tracing about whom we know very little. Um, one of these children whose history you would really like to know in its entirety, um, who would that person be? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I think I would really like to know what happened to the sons of Harold. Um, maybe especially Godwin. I feel like because Godwin bears the name of his, of his grandfather, Godwin, who's such an important figure in English history, and the idea that Earl Godwin's grandson should just sort of disappear somewhere. Did he stay in Scandinavia? Was he in Denmark? Was he in Russia? Did he go to Ireland? You know, he too might have lived a, an interesting life and we just don't know. We just can't kind of trace that. Um, so I think that that would be my answer. I'd really like to know what happened to him. Brilliant. And, and a follow up from a, a, a different uh, a different viewer. Um, he says that while researching the topic, while doing the research for your book, did you find that any of the figures were actually quite different from their common perception? I mean, Edgar, Edgar Atheling, insofar as people might know about him, perhaps doesn't necessarily have a terribly good press in historiography. So, um, yeah, was there any figure whose history um, either surprised you or is quite different from, from, from uh, general perception? Mm, I think it was Edgar, actually, because I think, you know, we all learn stories about the Norman conquest quite early in our study of English history and you learn about the important people are being Harold and, and William and it's all about them. And then there's this sense that Edgar was a bit ineffective or he sort of, oh, he was a bit of a failure. And, so, and, and when you remember how young he was, that just seems very harsh to me that we are judging this boy for, for not being able to take on the might of the Normans, you know, who were just so much kind of overwhelmingly more powerful than he could have been. Especially, I think, when you remember his his disrupted childhood, the fact that he was, you know, kind of came to England and didn't maybe know it very well and might often have felt like an outsider or something at, at the court of Edward the Confessor. You know, in one sense, he was kind of the heir to the throne, but also there were these other powerful people like Harold Gobinson, who were probably not willing to think of him as heir or something. So, you know, he's in a difficult position even before the conquest. And then this this kind of this thing happens that who would have been able to organize resistance to the Normans? I don't, you know, certainly it was a lot to ask of a teenage boy. Um, and so I think that sense of him as ineffective is just really, really unfair. And I was very just really interested to learn about, you know, his many travels and and the kind of variety of his life and and this sense that he was kind of, I don't know, he 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 adapted himself, he accommodated to to the loss of whatever kingdom or whatever expectations he might have had um, as a younger man. Uh, it wasn't like he was kind of pining all the time for, for I didn't get to be king of England. He did have, he moved, you know, he moved on. He had other things in his life. Um, 
so yeah I came to feel very sympathetic to Edgar and also I feel like we just ought to include him in the story of the conquest a little bit more yeah, um, uh, I, I want, um, we, we've probably got time for, 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 for one more question. We've got two or three minutes. Um, so I'm going to take the um, opportunity of asking a question myself, if I may, uh, Eleanor, um, continuing from what you were just saying about Edgar, which is about the whole idea of childhood, really. Mm. Um, have we got any sense of um, the age at which childhood is thought to have, was thought to have finished and adulthood begun? In, in Anglo-Saxon England, it's always stunning to discover how, how many of the major actors of early medieval history are in their early 20s or younger. Yeah, yeah. yeah I know. So sort of in, in thinking about the book, I had to kind of think about how am I going to define children or what does it matter? And like, I wanted to call them the last children of Anglo-Saxon England, but of course, in a medieval context, you know, 15 year olds are not children, really. They're, they're entering adulthood at that age. So what I was thinking about in terms of of that kind of definition was about points, I guess, transitioning to adulthood. So sort of markers of maturity, like marriage, like possessing significant lands, like having kind of taken a public position, which none of these people had done before the conquest. So there are sort of, there are young people who might fit into this group, but you know, if they were married before 1066, I wasn't as interested in them because I felt like they were older. And I think what interested me in about this group of people was that sense of, people who had not yet found their place in the world, you know, who were still in a position of junior to as an older generation of fathers or leaders or, you know, kind of under the guidance of other people who then are sort of without that guidance, what do they do next? Um, so, yeah, I think in, in terms of sort of whether these are these people are, are kind of children or adolescents, I mean, clearly in one sense, they're not really children in our sense. They've got much more kind of activity and agency and are much more is expected of someone like Edgar at 15 or whatever than would be expected of a 15 year old boy today but also in terms of the kind of power or the influence or the experience that they might have or be able to wield they're at a disadvantage compared to to much older um warriors you know people of the generation of Harold or William the Conqueror yeah no, th no thank you it's an absolutely brilliant way of making sense of this period I think a really really sort of wonderful angle of approach and as your talk has shown it's, it's it, it reveals all sorts of uh, you know great facets of the period we're coming to our conclusion I'm sorry to say the time has absolutely sped by so before I give a final vote of thanks uh, to Eleanor um, there's just a few if you like technical notes to round off with on behalf of the festival ideas um, as I said at the start um, the talk tonight happily has been recorded, so you'll be able to watch it on the festival YouTube channel uh, via the Watch Again section of the festival website after the 24th of June. Um, uh, as, uh, as I've indicated and as, as has been said in the chat, you can, of course, purchase a copy of Eleanor's wonderful book, Conquered. I recommend it very enthusiastically uh, from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books, uh, or elsewhere, of course. Um, and we very much hope, of course, that you'll continue to be engaged with the Festival of Ideas. Please look at our website. Um, please continue the conversation on social media uh, and so on, of course. But finally, then, thank you very much to Eleanor for, for giving us all this amazing uh, account of um, the last children of Anglo-Saxon England, giving us this really uh, distinctive and profitable way into uh, understanding the Norman Conquest. Thank you especially for giving a, a York inflection uh, to your talk. We, uh, we, we certainly appreciate that. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you everybody uh, for coming this evening. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks.